the back of some of these videos than for y'all to hear me say that Jonah was on the ark. <laughs> Which I did in one of the tapes. And I think I did something with Noah. I think I uh, put Noah in a whale one time. And last week I said the mongoloids had no melon for skin color. So that, that was an error on the last week. Now, when I watched the tapes, I saw that. And, of course, what I intended to say there was that, that those that have no uh, melon are the albinos, not the mongoloids. <laughs> they, have, they have melon. So I don't really I see your head in there than to hear some of the things I've said, <laughs> which is okay. Well, we've uh, been speaking of uh, Christian evolutionism, as you know, and, and we introduced it. And we found out really it's basically two religions because it's two philosophies with two opinions. And uh, we also talked about was there really a global flood and there's all kinds of evidence for a global flood and one of the, one of the greatest evidence for a global flood is the fact that 71% or more of the earth is covered by water. And what's amazing is that scientists, the NASA scientists, have speculated that there were gigantic floods on Mars. And they made all those gigantic canyons and carved up the surface of Mars, yet there's not a drop of water on Mars today. So they have gigantic global floods on Mars without water, but they will not accept global floods on the Earth where there's 71% of it covered with water. And if you bring the mountains down, there's enough water to cover the entire Earth. If you just bring the mountains down, if the land elevation was uh, back uh, like it was pre-flood days, there's still enough water out there to cover the earth right now. All the land. And we've already addressed that, though. And we talked about dinosaurs. and We uh, saw evidence that man and dinosaurs have coexisted and have lived at the same time. And they're not separated by 65 to 70 millions of years. The Ice Age, ancient or recent, it's recent, it's post-flood, because only by having cool land masses and large amounts of warm water can you get the amount of evaporation and convection uh, to be able to get the amount of ice and snow to fall to form ice caps. You can't do it by slow cool down of a primordial boiling ocean earth. It's absolutely impossible to get ice caps under those circumstances of uh, how the earth is supposed to come into being by the big bang and the big cool down and all that. You just, it just cannot be. And evil, has it evolved or is it sin? In other words, is evil a violation of a moral code of our creator God or is evil something that evolved? So if we had to evolve to be evil, then we must have started out good and we've evolved evil. Or else we started out evil, now we're evolving to be good. Now, how many people believe that? How many people believe that actually we're, we're, uh, we're getting, you know, good? And uh, all we have to do is look at the earth, and I think you'll see with the peoples and dictators and power-hungry people and wealth-hungry people, power and wealth, you know, and things just don't look too good. Of course, the answer, of course, is the fact of repentance of sin and uh, things will get better. Well, last week we talked about race. Did race come about by evolution? Or well, what? And we concluded there's no such thing as race. In the Bible, it doesn't teach race. There's no such thing as mongoloid, coscoid, negroid, Australoid, and all those things. That is an invention of man. That is an invention of uh, evolutionary heredity. In other words, race does not exist. There's no difference between a mongoloid and a coscoid and a negroid, osteroid. There's no difference in us. We're all the same. All we have is just little different hair characteristics, little different fat depositions in the eyelids, a little difference in skin color. But we found out last week that skin color can be in 16 different shades. And you can get all 16 shades by marrying one mulatta to one other mulatta. And if they had 16 children all and had one type of each that's possible according to genetics, then uh, you'd have 16 shades of children. It's all possible from one set of parents. 
And the only reason we're mainly all white is because we came from Western Europe. Most of us, our ancestors, are from Europe. And that's the area that favored the uh, genes that are on those chromosomes to produce only a small amount of melon. That's the reason we have white skin color. The people who settled down in Africa and closer to the tropics and the heat and hot weather and everything, they were favored. Uh, the dark skin, the ones that produce a lot of melon to have dark skin were favored because those that were light skin developed skin cancer and they died out, therefore they didn't produce any children. So that those genes died out in that area. They sort of were bred out. Now all of us understand, we may not understand it, but we certainly have a, a basic recognition of the fact of what you can do by isolating genes. If you isolate a certain amount of genes, from three different kinds of dogs, you get a Doberman Pinscher. But if you just turn Doberman Pinschers and German Shepherds and Poodles and Cocker Spaniels all together and let them interbreed for about 20, 25 years, you will not have any more Cocker Spaniels or Poodles or Dobermans or Shepherds. You will have a what we call Heinz 57 variety dog, but really that's basically the pure dog of the bunch. We call these purebreds. Purebred dogs like a, a, a poodle, that is a manipulation of genes. And if you just turn poodles loose with all other dogs, the poodles will vanish. The Cocker Spaniel will vanish. Doberman Pinchers will vanish. All these dog types will vanish. And uh, but God promised that, uh, you know, it would not flood again, so you don't have to worry about that rain. <laughs> but uh, that's the same thing with people. If people just indiscriminately married, the thing we call race would vanish. We'd see white people and black people and different shades of people, but we'd see them all through the same family if people just intermarried without any thought process of race. But you see, the problem is we have introduced a whole bunch of social cultural problems with this because of prejudice. And that's the reason why we have the problems we have with what we call race. See, race was not invented by God. Race is something that happened as a consequence of the flood and the Tower of Babel. When the Tower of Babel occurred and language was confused and people scattered different parts of the earth, in the meantime, the ice caps were melting because now we have weather and the ice caps are melting and the water came up in the old ancient seashore which we call the continental shelf. If you take the water in the ocean down the continental shelf, all land masses would be connected. People could travel to anything we call a continent today. And when the water came up, people got isolated. Now when people got isolated, they also degraded. In other words, God got them away from the Tower of Babel because they were coming up with a, a religion there. They were coming up with a worship center. They were attempting to make a name for themselves. That's what it says in the Genesis account. God said, we better go down and check and see what them people are doing down there. And the people down there said that uh, God told us to scatter, but we're not going to do it. We're going to stay here and make a name for ourselves. Well, you know that God does not tolerate people making names for themselves. We are to honor and glorify the name of God. We're not to make a name for ourselves. Well, God scattered them by the use of confusion, confusion of language. They scattered out, the ice caps melted, they got isolated. That's where these people that originally scattered out built all of these remarkable civilizations that we find the remains of today, but we don't find anybody that knows particularly anything about them. Have to sort of try to figure it out. But around all these amazing civilizations from the past, that where we find all these magnificent cities and temples and... Uh, 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 you know, these uh, astronomical data and all these things, all documented in stone and writings and carvings and everything and big cities built high in the mountains. We have no idea how they got the stones there, how they put them together, how they cut them out. We don't know anything. They had water systems, they had sewer systems, they had air conditioning systems without electricity. And they had all these things. This is a mark of a very brilliant civilization in our past, what has happened? It's degraded. In other words, all these civilizations, when you really get to checking them, you'll finally somewhere find a temple 
And in that temple you'll find an altar. And that altar eventually was used to sacrifice human beings. And that's when the civilization degraded and seemed to have vanished. It would appear that the people that are what we call native people or barbarians or jungle people, whatever we want to call them, that were uh, living out just on what they could pick or find, you know, or hunt. The indications seem to be that they are the descendants of the people that built those magnificent civilizations. And then we say to ourselves, what in the world happened? What happened that these people could build these magnificent temples with all this knowledge and everything and knew all about the stars and the movements of planets and seasons and everything like that? How did they disintegrate to the point that they're just jungle people and they're just barely uh, pulling out a, uh, a meager living by living off the land or hunting? Some of them even turned to cannibalism. And they would uh, war against uh, neighboring uh, tribes and uh, they would actually uh, eat human flesh. And it, the indications are that these magnificent civilizations were built by their ancestors. So you see, not only have we had a, a loss of all kinds of things, uh, we've lost a lot of, uh, uh, of technology because they had that technology and the consequences of race and belief in race is to reject the accuracy of the historical Genesis account. There's nowhere about race there. And the consequence is racism. The belief that there's people or groups evolved separately, some superior to others. See, if you believe in evolution and you believe that races are evolving, you have to believe that races are still evolving. You can't believe in evolution of animals and evolution of trees and plants and not believe in evolution of humans. You have to go ahead and believe in evolution of humans. And if you believe in evolution of humans and we have these three distinct groups or four, then you have to believe that they're all four evolving along their own lines, not equally. There's never equal evolution if there's any such thing. So one has to be evolving the others. Therefore, one is superior to the others. And so since evolution is survival of the fittest, there's nothing wrong with the superior group killing all the others or making them their slaves. You see, that's if you believe in evolution. You say, oh, no evolutionists. We don't believe in slavery and things like that. Well, then you're violating the very concept of evolution because evolution is survival of the fittest. One is superior to the others. Why did the animals today survive the animals that supposedly have gone into extinction? Because they are superior. They're better equipped to be able to adapt. So which one of us is better equipped to survive and adapt? The Caucasians, the Mongoloid, the Negroid, the Australoids. Which one of us? You see, you get yourself in a very, very perplexing position and when you believe in race. Well, the, the other results, of course, which I was just alluding to, uh, we'll come to in just a moment, but uh, th this has bad influences on mission fervor. In other words, if you believe in evolution, you believe the superiority of certain races or white race over the other races, then we get sort of a smug feeling of uh, we're superior and we're going to send some missionaries out to these poor black people in the jungle or something like that. And it's just a bad attitude. You know, these people are absolute equals to us. Uh, for God, they're, they're our fellow created beings. They're not inferior. They are the same as we are. You see, this gets involved a lot of times in this male-female thing. Some males feeling that males are superior to females. It's the same thing. Men and women were absolutely created equal by God. God said, let us go down and create man, the word Adam, mankind, in our image, and he created them male and female. He says he created Adam, male and female, not a hermaphrodite, but mankind. See, Adam's name was Ish. Eve's name was Isha. Adam is a, actually a word for mankind. And Adamah is the word for land, dirt. So mankind, Adam, came from Adamah, the ground, see. Adamah and Adam. And uh, distorted views of the biblical account, and that's the curse on Ham, that thing that goes around, which there's no truth to whatsoever. 
that people were black because God cursed him. And of course the loss of technology, we have seen this already where these people set up these civilizations after they dispersed after the Tower of Babel and they lost it. You know why they lost it? Because they got farther and farther away from God. Same thing as what happened to us in the United States. We get farther and farther away from God, we're going to have a loss of technology and we're going to have cultural degeneration. We're already in cultural degeneration. I had an article I took out of the paper this past week and it says uh, a so-and-so left the school system in a certain state as a male and he's going to go back to teach school this fall as a female. He's had a sex change operation. That's impossible. See, God made us what? What did he say? Let us make mankind in our image and he created them male and female. See, male and female. He makes you one or the other. You either have two X chromosomes and you're a female or you have an X and Y chromosome and you're a male. Now sometimes people have XXX, that's called trisomy X. And uh, these, are the, these are abnormalities of the splitting of the cells in the ovary in the female. And what happens is rather than dividing the X up, X here and X there, and then taking those and dividing those two X's into two more, which winds up with four cells with one X each in, and one becomes the egg and three become polar bodies. Some way or another, two of those X's got in this one. And then the husband donated an X, and so this offspring has three X's, trisomy X. But you see, that's not a new sex. That is an abnormal distribution of chromosomes. Most uh, abnormal distribution of chromosomes results in the death of the fetus. But there's a few, like uh, uh, Down syndrome. Down syndrome baby has three number 21 chromosomes. That's its problem. You and I in this room have two number one, 21 chromosomes. We've got one from our father, one from our mother. A child with Down syndrome has two number 21 chromosomes from one of the parents and one from the other. Three. Usually comes from the mother. This trisomy, uh, you know, this, this trisomy chromosome 21. So you see, that doesn't change the sex of the child, doesn't change anything. Doesn't change God's intentions or God's design. There's no evolution involved. These are birth defects that take place. All this is a consequence of the fall of man, the flood, the tower. You know, all these points that we studied last, uh, last year, you know, this, this past uh, spring rather, when we went through the uh, chronology of the Old Testament, we went through all those covenants, we went through uh, how God has disclosed himself to mankind. Uh, mankind keeps degrading, but God keeps tempting to pull man up to a higher level, you know, because man, God wants to have fellowship with me. Well, so these are the things about a loss of technology, cultural degeneration. Romans 1, we'll come to Romans 1 when we talk today about uh, our National Academy of Sciences. And, but anyway, the deliberate rejection of the worship of the living God results in degeneration. In other words, when you turn your back on God, you're going to have loss of technology and cultural degeneration. That's just a fact. And we think that we're really smart. Well, where are we headed? Well, here, let's review ourselves again. We're headed toward a future. And uh, you can see over here, evolution-wise, the future is the death of our star. Whereas our future over here is eternity. And of course here, we started from nothing and got something because we had a creator God to do it. On the other side, you started with nothing and got something by spontaneous generation, which is an impossibility. Violates every law of science. And then you finally go through all this chaos over there, but here, God did it and said it was very good in each day. He organized it into kinds. Over on the other side under evolution, uh, it had to wait for millions and billions of years to finally organize itself and come up with life. The non living to the living. Whereas God just spoke the living into existence. And then of course simple to the complex. We're, the evolutionist says we started simple, we're getting more complex, we were uh, chaos and now we're getting better and it's survival the fittest and we're competitors and the future, our future is the death of our star. We have no future in evolution. Absolutely no future. No value, no morals, no ethics, no anything. You know, just survival the fittest. 
they try to say, well, no, we don't believe that. We believe in ethics, we believe in law, we believe in morality and all that. It's their definition of morality. Not God's. Well, the future here is a harmony. And if you're pre-trib, pre-meal, God's going to show us how that harmony would have worked in that thousand-year millennium. But the whole point where you're pre pre-meal or post-meal or ah-meal or no-meal or whatever kind of meal you are, the fact is there's an eternity in this. And the eternity is in the presence of God to walk and talk with God. And so that's where we're headed. Well, today, we want to talk about the National Academy of Sciences. This is not National Academy of Sciences bashing week. This is a very fine organization, very prestigious, but the biology and natural science area of the National Academy of Sciences is absolutely anti-God. And they have an agenda of evolution, and they're pressing it to its max. So under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences, this group had, had the National Academy to put out a book. It's called Teaching About Evolution and the Na Nature of Science. They tried to put that in the hands of every natural science and biological science teacher in the United States. They tried to give it to everybody. They're concerned about preschool, pre uh, kindergarten four-year-olds all the way through the university student. And I'll uh, show you a little bit about their agenda here in a minute. But uh, like I say, they do some fine things. If you're nominated to become a member of the National Academy of Sciences, you are being recognized as one of the top people worldwide in your area. You know, I mean, the recognition is tremendous. And uh, the list of people that belongs to the Academy of Sciences is very uh, substantial and a very influential people in the sciences. Well, now Nature Magazine, which is a very prestigious uh, science uh, journal, did a survey. And they surveyed all 517 members of the biological and physical science members. In other words, all 517 Bio biological science and physical science people that were members, 517 were surveyed. And this was published in Nature. I didn't put down the, the, journal, the journal number there. I, I didn't have it. But this is, this is evolution stuff. In other words, this is not something somebody did from a creationist side or anything. This is just, I'm telling you something, that the National Academy of Sciences, the members were surveyed by someone who did a survey for Nature magazine. And so the results, when they tallied them, over half of the members, over half of those 517 responded, which is pretty good on a survey. If you can get 50% returns on a survey, you're doing really good. Most returns on a survey, 10% would be great. Advertising campaigns, if they can get a return of 2 to 3%, they make money. 2 to 3%. That's the reason why you get so much junk mail. Because there only has to be two out of every 100 households that gets it, there only have to be two to respond out of every 100 to make that totally uh, pay for itself and, and make them a profit. So they got a 50% return here, and 72% responded that they were atheists, that's your, of our biologists and our natural scientists, that's uh, members of this very prestigious organization, the very best. So 72% are atheists, 20% agnostic, and 7% said they believed in a personal God. Now, if, if you don't believe this group is biased, they have to be biased. If uh, you have 93% uh, that are basically anti-God, 93%. And uh, this is of the 50% that responded. Now, the other 50% that did not respond, we have no reason to believe they would be any different to this. Okay, now, there is an answer to this, though, and the answer is called Refuting Evolution by Jonathan Safarti. It's a handbook for students, parents, teachers, and uh, countering the latest arguments for evolution. And that's the little blue book I've been referring to. And today what I'd like to do is just to bring to your attention a couple of things in this little book. And then I'm going to go over to one of my biology books. In fact, it's one of the books I use to teach biology from. And it is a rank evolution 
book, textbook. You say, why in the world would you use as a Christian and as a creationist, absolute creationist, total anti-evolutionist, why would you use an evolutionist biology book? Well, basically, it's all that's available. Now, I could search and probably find one. It's been sanitized with some uh, Christian teaching organization. But see, with me teaching students, the kind of students I'm teaching, I want them to know everything there is to know about the enemy. You see, I don't know if y'all know it or not, but uh, old General Patton in World War II, one of the reasons he was so successful is he did a study of all the German generals he was going to come up against. He studied everything he could find out about them, how they fought, how they acted, what they might do. And the man was absolutely a genius when it came to figuring out what they were going to do. And he was always ahead of them. And that's what had made him so successful as a warfaring general. And uh, so I want, um, I want my students to know everything about evolution, but they, very, they all know absolutely that I'm an absolute creationist. But I use an evolution book so I can point out the 95% truth that's in the book and the 5% of untruth because it's that 5% that slipped in there. It's so dangerous. You know, if you just saw absolute lies, heard absolute lies, lie, 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 you'd recognize a lie. But if somebody tells 99% the truth all the time and they slip a 1% in on you, it's not so easy to recognize. And so evolution has chosen... Of course, the biological area, because that's, that's where it's at. And so they, they sort of hide underneath this cloak of respectability of biology. And uh, they've invaded. And I'll, I'll show you that in this biology book. Biology book's about that thick, very good book. I'll, I'll just read you a couple of things on a couple of pages, show you how subtle and insistent and absolute it is. Well, this, this uh, little book here is... Uh, Dr. Safarti's answer to the pamphlet put out or the book put out by the National Academy of Sciences. Here's what the guidebook states in the purpose, in its preface. In other words, the teaching evolution. This is what the foreword says. Many students receive little or no exposure to the most important concept in modern biology, a concept essential to understanding key aspects of living things, biological evolution. In other words, the very first thing they're saying is the students in our nation are being deprived of the most fundamental fact there is in biology, and that is of biological evolution. And it says that uh, they receive little or no exposure uh, to evolution. And it says, uh, they, after here, they said they reviewed a number of biology textbooks, and they found all of them to be blatantly pro-evolution. Well, let's consult a good college-level uh, biology book. Journey in the Life, Arms and Camp. I use basically two biology books, alternating back and forth occasionally. I'll stick with one a few years and go to the next one, Arms and Camp, and the other one is um, oh, Sylvia Mater. See, I want to use one by man, one by woman, show that I'm you know, co-equal and accepting, politically correct. Both very fine biology books. But here's a very fine biology book. It has a lot of truth in it. Starts out, an organism is a living thing. Well, that's wonderful. Scientific method, that's great too. Observe, hypothesis, experiment, you know, all those things we talked about. And do predictions and control treatments and experimental treatments. See, in other words, they're really off to a good start, looks like. And because they fed up that organism is a living thing. And hey, we got a uh, scientific method and that type of thing. Now another page. The history of science abounds with dogmas that turned out to be wrong, although for a time they were widely accepted. Indeed, many statements in this book will undoubtedly be proved untrue in the future. This is one reason why the cautious person or society will not place too much faith or invest too heavily in a new scientific discovery until it has been well tested. Well, see, this is a good start. And uh, I thought, when I first reviewed this book, I thought, well, now, this is going to be all right, you know. And uh, then right down here it says, fundamental concepts of biology. It says, living things are organized into units called cells. I said, well, that's exactly right. All living things are composed of living cells. 
Living things are highly ordered. I said, that's right too. They are highly ordered. They're complex. They're highly ordered. God made it that way. Living things obtain and use energy from their environment to maintain life. That's true also. Living organisms, organisms respond to stimuli from the environment. That's right. You stick me with a pen, I jerk my hand back. Living things develop. That's right. I was born as a child and I mature and grow up and develop and that type of thing. Living things reproduce themselves. That's true. My wife and I have had four children. The living to the living transfer a life from our lives to the lives of our children, things like that. The information each organism needs to survive, develop, and, and to reproduce is segregated within the organism and passed on from one to the other. That's true also. Our children, you know, have our genes. We pass them on to them. Some of them are as good as I am and some of them are as mean as my wife is, you know. You know? <laughs> and uh, she'll, make, she'll hear that one tonight and I'll be in trouble. Now we get down to number eight though. Living things evolve and are adapted to their environments. Today's organisms have arisen by evolution. They stuck this on on the end of all those absolute facts that are provable. Observable, you can do tests, you can do repeatable tests, you can gather the data. But this one here, living things evolve and are adapted to their environments. Now it's true that organisms adapt to environment, but they don't evolve. But see, this is stated as a statement of fact tacked on the end of seven other statements of fact. And I thought, uh-oh. And so I wondered about that one. And then going a little farther, you know, we come up to something here. It says, science is only one way of exploring the world, history, religion, and philosophy, and others. Science deals only with things that can be experienced directly or indirectly through the senses. <laughs> indirectly through the senses? You know what that's saying? That I can experience science by just thinking about it. I don't have to do any experiments. I can just think about it. And it just, uh, uh, just, just think it into existence and that's it. And it says that uh, supernatural relationships, whether or not they exist, they are not the business of science. Well, evolution is supernatural. But see, they're, they're slamming at religions, what they're doing, Christianity. Although science does not deal with the supernatural or with the illogical, scientists themselves may be just as emotional, political, illogical as anybody else. It may affect their scientific efforts. Every now and then, for some reason or another, I don't know why, if these evolutionists in these books, they'll put a little gem in there and they don't realize what they're saying. What this person just said is that they can be just as illogical as anybody. And uh, they certainly are proving that one. Well, let's just read a couple of more here. The abundant supply of water on earth is one of the major factors that made evolution of life possible. In other words, water made evolution possible. I don't know how many of y'all knew that. And since we have all this water we've evolved the farthest but now since they're supposed to head water on Mars where's the evolved Martian life you know supposed to carve out all that Martian landscape with all that uh, global floods on Mars when the absence of water what happened to all the water you know that type of thing well they've got all kinds of ideals what happened to that water but where'd they get their ideals not but from evidence or experiments but by what thinking about it you see where they're able to pull that off they can just think about Mars, look at the, Mars, and they can conclude by looking at Mars, there was giant global floods there with gigantic oceans, even in the absence of water. So they're trying to find out what in the world. They speculate now all the water's underneath the surface, frozen solid. So see, it's unseen. You can't test that. Well, you could put a rover up there and try to find some. They haven't been able to do it. You know, anything they put up there, haven't found it. Well, cell theory, all organisms consist of one or more cells. Cells are fundamental units of life. Cells arise only by the division of existing cells. That's true. That's absolute truth. You only get life from the living. All living are organized into cells. A fossil is any preserved evidence of life long past. Now that's what a fossil is, the official definition. It's evidence of what? Life long past. How do they know that? What kind of experiment can you do on that? 
What kind of repeatable experiment can you do to prove that this fossil is evidence of a long time past? We're told that. We're indoctrinated to that. Fossils are dated by rocks, and rocks are dated by fossils. It's circular thinking. We call them index fossils. There's no more in such thing as index fossil. Who put the index on the index fossils? The evolutionists did. They say that the invertebrate marine is the oldest. The vertebrate marine is next oldest. Then the amphibs, and then the reptiles, and then the birds, and uh, mammals, and man. They stacked it up the geological column in the order as how they have thought out evolution to have occurred and then built that column and then point to that column as evidence that it did occur. Again, circular thinking. No evidence. No evidence. Well, horse evolution. Have you ever heard that one and seen those pictures? Um, on the different sizes of the horses. You know, a little horse, bigger horse, a much bigger horse, a gigantic horse. That's not the way it is. What you better do is you better count the ribs on those horses. And you'll find out that the horse, the rib count is changing. And these fossils here of these horses, the rib count is different. And the evolution does not go the way that they even said it goes, even if it did occur. They ignore that. They strictly were going by horse size. That's why, that's why they do it in humans. They take the size of the skull. The smaller the skull, the older you are. Millions and millions of years. The bigger your skull, the more recent you are. On CC capacity, cubic centimeters of capacity of the skull, determines where you are in the evolutionary event. Do you ever wonder how come when they find a piece of a skull or a jawbone or something, instantly they can tell you where it fits in the man's evolution, how old it is, and they can tell you uh, how tall they were and how big they were. They can tell you everything about them. They found footprints in lava flow where the lava ashes, uh, something had walked through there, and then it got preserved, probably covered up with other uh, lava ashes and things. And they, they, I had a picture, I don't know if it's in this book or not, and they showed the picture of what the person, the ape person looked like that made those footprints. They actually showed a picture of it. That's like building that man out of that pig's tooth and calling him Nebraska man, you know. And uh, these things don't last too long, usually. Uh, Darwin and Wallace became convinced that only an evolutionary origin for species could reasonably explain the distribution of modern plants and animals, and biologists since have agreed with them. That's not true. Biologists do not agree with Darwin and Wallace. Many agree because they're evolutionists. But there's lots that don't agree. But the book says, and biologists since have agreed with them. As if all biologists agree with them see. Well, the first well-documented case of natural selection causing evolution in a wild population was selection of birds for camouflage, uh, for camouflage pepper moths. Right here it is in this book, calling the pepper moth thing evolution. The peppered moth has been, been found out to have nothing to do with evolution. It's been known for 40 or 50 years that the pepper moths have nothing to do with evolution. And yet here it is in this book. And this book, I believe, is about a 1991 book. So it's 10 years old. And you know, we've known for 30 or 40 years that was not true. Well... I want you to turn to your mind. You've seen these pictures here before. The embryos. The embryos that are the same. That we, where you're a turtle or a bird or a person or whatever the a pig, I believe, is. Human, a mouse, a turtle, a pig, and a chick. We all look the same as an embryo. That just isn't true. The person who did that, a guy by the name of Heckel, out of Germany. It's been proven now that that was absolutely uh, a hoax. In other words, he, he deliberately did that. Well, we come back to this book. Let's look at a couple other spots here. Uh, the contrast is between religion and creation with evolution and science. I think I have an overhead which probably states that, yes. In the, the National Academy of Sciences book teaching about evolution, it contrasts religion, creation together against evolution science. Do you see how they've done that? 
In other words, religion, creation is religion, but evolution is science. And they contrast the two with each other. And that's one of the things they do throughout that little book that they gave to all of the, um, the science teachers and everybody. So the debate is a dispute between two worldviews. And uh, so uh, let's find a couple other things here. Many people do not realize the teaching of evolution propagates an anti-biblical religion. The first two tenets of the Humanist Manifesto II of 1973 signed by many prominent evolutionists, here they are. Number one, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Humanists believe that man is a part of nature and is emerged as a result of continuous process. And uh, then here's a quote uh, about how that the evolutionists need to move out into society and to propagate uh, their beliefs. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselyters of a new faith, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity and ever human being. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preacher, for they will be ministers of another sort utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or large state university. The classroom must and will become an area of conflict between the old and new, the rotting corpse of Christianity together with all of its adjacent evils and misery with the new faith of humanism. It will undoubtedly be a long, arduous, painful struggle replete with much sorrow and many tears, but humanism will emerge triumphant. It must if the family of humankind is to survive. In other words, only evolution offers hope. The humanist way, evolution, anti-God, that type of thing offers hope. Teaching about evolution, page 6. To teach the probability of change and to see that change is an agent of opportunity rather than a threat is a silent message and a challenge in the lesson of evolution. In other words, uh, we are to, uh, as evolutionists, we're to, at every opportunity, teach evolution to children of any age whatsoever and to do it in such a way to make sure and put down any kind of effort at all for this thing called Christianity. And the problem is that teaching evolution, it says that many, uh, it's compatible with many religions. That's what they say in the book. And, of course, uh, the author here says it might surprise many people to realize how many church leaders do not believe in the Bible. In other words, there's a lot of church leaders that basically do not believe the Bible. And teaching about evolution on page 58 points out that many religious people believe that God used evolution, theistic evolution. I'd say we have people right here at church that believe that. That was, that was taught all through the Baptist churches back in the 50s and 60s, uh, theistic evolution. Uh, it was being taught in our seminaries. And uh, there was a couple of large, uh, uh, well-known Bible theologians that believed it, and uh, it was taught, and it was brought right down, brought to our pulpits, and everybody got comfortable and were able to accept evolution and, uh, and, and, and creation at one and the same. It was God's method of doing it. But God's method of using chaos and death and struggle and killing? Now what Genesis says, Genesis says God did it, on six, in six days, and then each day it said it was good, and after he created mankind, he said it was very good. And he established uh, this as um, his creation. Well, more blatantly, teaching about evolution recommends many books that are openly atheist, like those by Richard Dawkins. Uh, on page 129, it says, Statements about creation should not be regarded as reasonable alternates to scientific explanation for the origin and evolution of life. In other words, don't accept anything about creationism. Since anything not reasonable is unreasonable. Uh, teaching about evolution is in effect saying that believers in creation are really unreasonable and irrational. See, that's what happened. I used to go out and debate some of these people. I basically quit it because I don't want to lower myself to that anymore, to be quite honest with you because I've learned how they are. I went to Eastern State University uh, and uh, what a debate, it was an open forum and to address students. And 
and uh, the science department, the biologists, were the sponsors of this thing. And so they allowed the students to invite me to come as an answer to all the evolutionists that they had invited to come. And so the sponsors really thought I was coming as a, a religious preacher or Bible-thumping person. But when I got there and I didn't mention the Bible, they kept trying to bring the Bible in. They kept trying to bring religion in. I said, oh, I'm not accepting that. We're here to have a scientific discussion. They got so mad at me, they, they accused me of buying my degree. I mean openly in front of the students. They accused me that I was a dishonest. I was not, couldn't call myself a scientist. I was dishonest. And I must have bought my degree because no reputable university would have given me a degree with my thought process. I mean, it was ridiculous. They covered me up with mud, you know. And I just smiled and went on about it. And I think I might have told you this before, that after the thing was over, they wouldn't let the students talk to me. No, 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 no student was allowed to ask me a question or talk to me. And in the parking lot, some of the students came out to talk to me, and I thought, oh, man, they've done sick them on me. <laughs> They're going to really get me. The students came and apologized for the behavior of their professors. They said, we may not agree with what you had to say, but we do feel you had the right to say it. See, that's a university student for you. They may not agree with you, but they, they want to make sure you have the right to say it. And they recognized that was not given the right to say what I wanted to say. And I'd been invited there to give an alternate view. And they were not accept that alternate view. And you read these books, you'll find out that this is the way it works. The way it works. Um, so since science does have its limits, normal operational science deals only with repeatable, observable processes in the present. See, here's the thing about a lot of people are missing. Scientific experimentation is done in the present. You can't do scientific experimentation in the past or in the future. You, you know, tomorrow, if you do it tomorrow, that's today. In contrast, evolution is a speculation about the unobservable and unrepeatable past. You can't repeat what's in the past, so how can you check your experiment? We've already seen where the Miller and Urey experiment was really a bad experiment. We've already seen where carbon dating is not reliable beyond a few thousand years. We've already seen how that uh, the uh, cosmic spheres on the moon suggest an age of no older than 10,000 years for the moon. And the cosmic spheres on the earth are just not here. There's very few of them. Nickel content of the ocean, helium concentration in the atmosphere, magnetic uh, strength here of the earth. I mean, just, you know, all these things point and prove the earth is not very old. We can't prove how old the earth is, but we certainly can prove it's not very old. That we can prove by things that are observable right now and it's available. Well, teaching about evolution avoids discussing the vast gulf between non-living matter and the first living cell. See, that's one of those big gaps. They don't even address it. They do not address where matter came from. See, in other words, uh, this book, which is supposed to be teaching evolution, doesn't even have a foundation. It has no foundation of where did the matter come from and how did the non-living get to become the living. And then they propose that, uh, that uh, there's many, many similarities and proofs to show how that, for instance, amphibians uh, evolved into reptiles or how, uh, you know, the fish evolved into amphibians. And they say there's many, many fossils to prove this. And yet, when you subject it to, to, to test, there is not one single fossil anywhere on this known earth in any university or collection or museum that is an intermediary between any kinds. We have no intermediaries between the, uh, the non-vertebrate and the vertebrate marine. We have no transis transistory forms between uh, the fish and the amphibs. There's none between the amphibs and the reptiles. There's none between the reptiles and mammals or land, or land animals or between reptiles and birds or between birds and men or reptiles and men or between apes and men. There's just not any missing so-called links. They do not exist. Every effort. They even tried to make the duck bill platypus one time. A missing link. Of course, that was foolishness. And uh, the missing links just are not there. And that Archaeopteryx, or however they pronounce that flying reptile bird, they try to say he's a flying dinosaur, a little tiny flying dinosaur. No, he's not. He's a bird. That's exactly. He had feathers and he flew. 
And uh, so the evolutionists admit that these missing links really cause them great difficulty. Listen to this. Darwin, uh, teaching about evolution, makes the following excuse on page 57. Uh, some changes in populations might occur too rapidly to leave any transitional fossils. In other words, the way they, they get around not having these transitions is evolution occurred too fast to leave one, yet we're told evolution occurs very, very slowly. And uh, so Darwin also excused the lack of transitional fossils by the extreme imperfection of the fossil record. In other words, there's missing links in the fossil record. Darwin admitted that. He says, I can't find them. And uh, in nature, a well-preserved fossil generally requires rapid burial. And teaching about evolution has some good photos of a fossil fish and well-preserved features, page 3, and a jellyfish on page 36. It says, search fossils certainly could not have formed gradually. How can you imagine a horse dies out here in a field somewhere? And it's going to lay around there for a few million years to be fossilized. How long do you think that dead horse lay out there? Only until somebody has it removed or, or if it just laying out there, it won't be long, there'll be nothing but bones and the bones will actually disintegrate and under certain circumstances. How in the world are you going to have something like that lay there for that long? Fossilization gives evidence of rapid burial, a cementing effect, closure, close it in, shut off the, uh, the air supply and uh, don't put too much heat and don't put too much pressure on it because if you do, you'll destroy it. And we've got some beautifully fantastic, well-preserved fossils of very intricate things which could not have survived the, the sedimentation process of weight and pressure and the heat that builds up in that like so-called process of fossilization is supposed to occur. Plus the fact, how do you get a tree fossilized standing straight up? How do you fossilize the roots first? You tell me how you do that. I'd really like to know. Well, this book goes on. And uh, I wanted to mention one other thing, though, before we did this. Uh, those embryos that I was showing you, the only way for Heckel, Dr. Heckel, to have drawn them looking so similar was to have cheated. This study was widely publicized in science journals and the secular media. And so there, here's a book published in 1998 still having them in there. You saw the, the book I had, the science book, 1991. Still has these embryos in there to try to impress college students that embryos are all similar. Well, I think we're, we're not going to rush through this. And again, I'll, I'll cover the latter part of this one next week and start into next week, which is Mount St. Helens. And Mount St. Helens is a very fascinating thing. I think you'll really enjoy that one. You'll probably want to go out and get the video and watch it. And uh, Steve Austin will absolutely just bore you to death with his tone, but he will thrill you to death with what he has to say. So maybe we'll do a, something on that video sometime.